So the topic is powerful asking to get what you want. And what happens pretty often is that, um, actually I'm gonna go back one, because I want you just to listen to me for a second, is that very often we assume that people don't want to give us what we want. And what I found as a widow and as a caregiver is that that actually isn't true. What I found was that people don't want to get it wrong. So powerful asking to get what you want is about how do you set yourself up so it's a win for you and it's a win for the person you're asking. Okay, so the first thing to do is to make clear distinctions. If you don't know what you want, there's no way that anyone can deliver it. Step one, bullet one of step one, <laughs> what you need to do is center yourself first, your way, whatever that is. So some people move, some people journal, some people meditate, some people exercise. If you are grounded in yourself, you're gonna make a stronger request. Whatever you wanna ask is gonna come out more clearly and more powerfully. The next thing you're gonna do is you're gonna look at your networks. Who are the people that you interact with professionally and personally, and what activities do you participate in now? Think about which of those people fuel you. You feel better around them. You tend to brainstorm with them or like to go out with them. And who are the people who drain you? The ones that you find toxic, you come away irritated or angry or sad. And so you're going to really look at those people because you already know the answers to that. And then the activities, uh, yoga, Pilates, uh, walking. What are the things that you do? I, I sing, I sing open mic. What are the activities that you participate in that fill you up? So you actually expand your capacity with your self-care. So these first three are literally about self-care, about expanding your ability to ask powerfully because you're centered in yourself. You're gonna experiment with what fuels and drains you. So there might be things that you have wanted to do and you haven't done. Them. There might be people you've wanted to connect with and you haven't connected with them yet. Try it, see what works. Play the child's game. I like this, I don't like this. I like this, I don't like this. It's very simple, it's really powerful because you can know very quickly how to expand your capacity. What you're gonna do is you're gonna start make, making much faster choices. If you're in business, if you're in small business especially, agility is your superpower. What that requires is that you not get paralyzed in the choices you make. In a time of transition or loss, and in this week, I'm in New York City, and it's rough. Coronavirus is here. <laughs> and so to be able to make your choices more quickly means that you are able to move. Now, in this moment, sometimes it's a choice to rest. What I've done as a practical strategy is I wrote down all the activities, all the things I like to do, all the people I like to connect with, on a board and I wake up in the morning and I look at the board and I check in with myself, in with my energy to see what I've got the energy to, to do today. And sometimes it's a lot and sometimes it's a little. So on the days when you have the capacity to do a lot, do that. And on the days when you don't, you need to retrench. So those might be planning days or cleaning days or something else, right? You have to trust your own knowing and do that. Look at your priorities. 
how do you want to spend your time? How do you want to be taking care of your health? How do you want to be making your money? How do you want your relationships to feel and go? Um, when you look at your priorities and you begin to align the people you spend time with, and the activities that you do with those priorities, then life starts getting more joyful, organically. In this moment of turmoil is a perfect time to relook at those things that maybe you've gotten comfortable and complacent with in your life, but they may not feel as true. You may want to be spending your time or doing different things or seeing different people these days, or more time with the ones you care about. Okay, the next step is to be specific in your ask. When I was a caregiver, we needed a lot. We needed community and connection, while my husband's energy and my energy were Waning. Sometimes he had a lot and sometimes he had a little. What I found was that people were terrified of getting it wrong. So I couldn't ask, I couldn't say something nonspecific like, can you please help me? Nobody knew what to do. But if I said something like, my husband's insurance doesn't cover oxygen, a person could send money for oxygen. That was an actionable task that could be fulfilled, really specific. Money for oxygen. Typically, why people don't get what they want is that the request is too vague or too small. So if it's too vague, it's something like, I want world peace. Can you help me with that? Nobody knows what to do unless that's their mission, too. If it's too small, it doesn't make your own heart sink. So it's, I need money to pay the bills. You're bigger than that. You're bigger than that. So that kind of request doesn't feel true to the people you're asking of it. They can help you, potentially, but it doesn't jive with who they know you to be. We think about asking for other people. It's actually much easier to ask for someone else. It was much easier for me to ask for things for my husband than it has been for me to ask for things for myself. And I think that's true for a lot of people. You know, how do you ask someone to become a client? How do you ask someone to become a friend? If you can figure out what you want first before you include other people, then it's much more powerful. When I decided to start dating again on Bumble, the last time I dated was 1992, I wrote my profile to describe as clearly as I could who I was. Because my idea was that then I would attract people who wanted exactly that person. So if you know exactly what you want, it's not, I want to work with entrepreneurs. I want to work with companies that have this revenue. It's the people I'm really fired up about serving are this group of people. But you're starting with yourself. You're not looking out into the landscape of possibilities and saying, well, there's a big group of people who need what I offer. What do you want? Do you want to do work one-on-one -on -one with people? Do you want to do movement stuff? Do you want to do intellectual work? Do you want to work, be behind a computer? What do you want first? And that will define where you look. Once you're clear about what you want first, then it narrows the field of all the millions and millions of possibilities that there are out there of communities that you could ask things of. 
once you know what you want first and you know what you want to ask of them, then that narrows it even further. It increases the likelihood you'll get it. You're going to look at the areas that your request impacts. Is it work? Is it relationships? Money, time, or health? Know that a move in any one of these can interact with the others, can move the others along. Another interesting thing about asking is you don't have to ask for the hardest thing. My recommendation is ask for something small. Start building the muscle. We're not accustomed to asking like the other person wants to give us what we're asking for. So that's the next point. Someone in your network wants to and can deliver on your request. I promise. There is someone who can easily give you exactly what you need. However, they are not going to do it if it's not, if they can't do it well. They want to be your hero. They want to provide what you're asking for. Going to use leverage. Who do you ask and what do you want? Specifically, very specifically. Um, and then you empower someone to do it for you. Step three is ask the right person in the right way. You need to have the people in your network who can provide what you're asking for. Typically what we do with our networks is we treat them as a default. So any transition or any loss any change in the environment. So that can be loss of a loved one. That can be a coronavirus pandemic, loss of a job. That can be, um, that can even be good changes. So a, 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 a new child in the family. All of these things change what you need. Well, I need, I need more help with, um, being sure that I get out and walk on a regular basis. So I'm so consumed with being a parent now. Or I need some resources to get to this person because I would like to serve into that specific network. And it can be anybody. Six degrees of separation. You know someone who knows exactly who you want to reach. And it's not a company. It's a one person to another person. One person to another person. So who is in your networks? I invite you to think of your networks as the potential for resources. What are the kinds of resources that you need? In different moments in time, you need different kinds of resources. If you're moving from one industry to another, you need whatever the bridge across from one industry and to another is who is that person or who is the person who knows that person three might be a little bit confusing so stand in your own ability to be resourceful and ask cleanly this is something i'm really passionate about what i discovered when i became a widow is that when there are circumstances very often beyond our control. My husband's death was beyond my control. Coronavirus is beyond our control. Um, loss of a job is beyond our control. But very often we are begin to be treated like we're broken. And there's a pervasive assumption about this and so people don't know how to be with us or talk with us because they don't want to hurt us and they want to get it right and it really requires stepping out of the circumstance beyond your control and figuring out what you're going to do next because innately you have the capacity to be resourceful that is a skill you have However, 
when there is a hit, like a circumstance that we can't control, that's just awful, we contract. It's natural. We contract. And the key is to allow that, to integrate it, and then to expand again. Then to stretch back into who we know ourselves to be. Because we're not our circumstances. When my husband was dying, I wanted to sing in a cabaret show. And I sang in two shows in the 11 months when he was sick. And the last one was the Tuesday before he died. And the reason I did that was I needed to remember that I was not just a caregiver and I would not just be a widow. And when these things happen, we feel like we are the circumstances that have hit us. And we're not. So it's really necessary to come back into ourselves and know that we have the capacity to move past, to get back to work, to get back to love to get back to connection, to find new ways to do it if we need to. So why do I say ask cleanly? I have been guilty of this myself. When you ask apologetically, it doesn't feel clean. It feels like there's some obligation being incurred. And when I historically have asked apologetically, I've been asking like they didn't want to help and support me. And you can feel that in the interaction. Whereas if you're asking from a place from re of resourcefulness, from knowing that if this person says no, you are innately a resourceful person and you have the capacity to ask another person. And thank you is enough. There is no need for more. Um, because part of my not liking to ask a lot of times has been about what kind of obligation am I incurring to the other person. What I discovered is that if I asked cleanly and they had the capacity to deliver, back to me what I was asking for. That was a win for both of us. I got what I needed, and they got to be a superhero. So they got to be of service, and everyone wants to be of service. They just don't want to feel like they can't. So if you make it so that they can, it's perfect, right? They will say yes. When I started asking this way, I began getting what I was asking for. I began getting the connections I wanted. I began getting the um, help with tech. I'm not that good with tech very often that I needed. To be clear about what you need in any particular moment and to ask a person who can deliver it is an enormously powerful interaction because it's a partnership. The final thing is to ask the right person for things which stretch but don't break them. I had a friend who was a big fundraiser for a nonprofit, and he talked to really, really big money guys. And one of the things he said was that he asked for money that would be a stretch, but that would not impact them too much. So he wasn't asking for their rent money. He might have been asking for a little more than they would just have given on their own. And so the key is to figure out who is that person who can do it relatively easily. Stretch, but not break. Um, so these are the three steps. So the first step is make clear distinctions. Figure out what you want to ask. And once you figure out what you want to ask, you're in a much more powerful position to ask it. 
be really specific. So you've already made the distinctions and figured out what you want. And then ask the right person in the right way. So after you get what you want, what's next? Talk to me. I can help you specifically. So you can book a resilient breakthrough call with me. And what we'll do is we'll uncover what request is going to solve your biggest current challenge in any area. We're going to lay out the steps to get you there as easily and quickly as possible. And you'll leave the session really relieved to have a roadmap and confident to take your next step. The other thing I'm offering is that I am doing, if you want to dig further into the roadmap piece, I'm doing a group workshop next week, next Tuesday. And so um, connect with me, and you can join the workshop if you want. Do we have any questions for me? Great. Thanks, Allison. Um, I'll let everyone know if you have a question, you can use the chat box or you can email info at SavvyLadies.org. And Allison, I just wanted to let you know I was seeing in the chat uh, messages where people were saying they understand what you're talking about, especially in the beginning about self-care, um, and then step three, asking cleanly. Um, just really thanking you for that and, and understanding it. So the first question we have is if you can give an example of asking cleanly and then an example of asking apologetically. OK. Um, so asking cleanly. Um, the the um, laying out, so the oxygen was an example of asking cleanly. Basically, I, I shared that my husband's insurance didn't cover oxygen when he couldn't breathe towards the end of his life. And a friend said, I want to send you $350. And I said, yes. Um, so that was, that was a pretty clean ask. Um, an, uh, an unclean ask was that I really needed um, funds to pay for things after my husband died. Um, and I wound up, you know, I'm in such bad shape. Can you help me out? That's an unclean ask. Because if the person says no, they feel like a bad person. That's not an ask from a resourceful place. Um, you know, another example of a clean ask, which I didn't even intend to ask. Um, my family um, helped with rent right after my husband died. And um, I wrote a blog post called Grief, Brain, and Bills on my website. Because my landlord called me up and she said on the 23rd of March, she said, um, where's the rent? And I said, oh, you're all set. You're all set. You know, uh, remember I paid that, that, you know, number of months up front? And she said, no, that ended in February. And I wrote this, uh, this thing in my blog. And, and it was from a real place of resourcefulness. It was, wow, this just happened. And I'm a resourceful person. I will figure it out. And within um, a half hour, my freshman college roommate messaged me and said, I'll pay your rent. And it still chokes me up because I hadn't seen her in something like 10 or 15 years. And I said, you do realize I live in New York City. She said, yeah. I'll pay your rent. Because when I wrote the blog post, I was, well, I, I also, in the blog post, I gave some specific ways of dealing with a person like me. Grief brain. Completely forgot about the rent. I said, first, what you do with a person like me after a transition or loss is you listen to what's going on with them. 
Because when you ask, what can I do to help, they have no clue. The next thing you do is you suggest that you will do one of the things that you identified from the conversation for them. And then the third thing you do is you execute asking for guidance as you go along. And I, after she made that offer and did that for me, I thanked her a million times. And I said, oh my gosh, thank you. And she said, you told me what to do and I just did it. And it was really the power of a clean ask. I made clear what I really needed specifically. March rent. And someone stepped up and said yes. So that's my answer. Okay, great. Thanks, Allison. Uh, the next question is asking if you can clarify point one a bit further. Okay. Step one about clear distinctions? I believe so. Okay. So after my husband died, I, we had been together for 25 years, and there were a lot of things that I had done that were ours or were his. And it wasn't entirely clear to me what I liked as myself as an individual. And any kind of transition like we're in right now will produce this kind of upending of what you like and don't like. The more you can look at your own assumptions, so there are ways we get set in ways of doing things. So if we're in a job and we know how to do that job and we're going along and we're getting it done and then a manager changes or the environment of the industry changes and something shifts that you have no control over and suddenly the way that you've been doing it before no longer works. Right? As our priorities change, what we like and don't like, the ways that we do things will shift along with them. So the more you can be willing to take a new look at those things after a shift, the more powerfully you can come out of it. Does that answer the question? Uh, I believe so, and I can let you know if I have a follow-up in the okay. chat. Uh, so I guess we can move on to the, the next question is asking, how do you keep the relationship or partnership going as healthy as possible? So I guess like after you've made the ask, how you can keep a, the relationship going. So keeping the relationship going is a matter of, we, we think of our relationships as very um, narrowly focused. So for example, one of the things I do besides being a consultant, I also tutor children. And my parents have their kids all at home. And the question is, how do you occupy the children? So I've been collecting links to send the parents for things that their children can do. So the answer to the question is, how you nurture the relationship is you look for places to serve that relationship and that person that are outside the spectrum of the narrow connection. Because it deepens... Um, it deepens the, uh, I'm looking for something better than connection. It, it deepens the, the uh, empathy. It deepens the um, feeling that across from you, this relationship is someone that you want to continue knowing and continue helping and continue um, having a mutual, mutually uh, beneficial experience together. Essentially, you're, you're increasing the joy by, by giving something beyond, hey, can you connect me with that person? I do lots of podcasts, and very often after the podcast, 
I'm looking into my networks for other people who might be great connections for that post. Hopefully that helps. <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. I believe this is the last question we have for you, which is asking if you can talk a bit more about bullet point three on the slide here, assess what fuels and what brings your vitality by experimenting. Okay. <clears throat> um, so my, my husband loved tennis, and I loved to sing. But after we got together, he didn't really like to sing. He didn't really like to go out to clubs and, and sing jazz or show tunes or whatever. And gradually what happened was that I started doing it less and less. Um, and, and then after he died, I started taking back those things that I'd given up. There are also things that he thought were ridiculous for me to want to do. And so I'm experimenting with actually doing those things to figure out if I like them. So what, what fuels me? Singing fuels me. Singing moves emotions through the body. I like performing on stage. What drains me? Um, yoga. I'm terrible at yoga. I don't know how to do it. They say the names, and I feel like an idiot. So I have a really hard time with yoga. I know lots of people love it, but I've tried it, and I'm looking around to see if I'm doing it right, which is not relaxing. So, so that's an, an example in, in the domain of um, self-expression. Um, what kind of people fuel or drain your vitality? So if they're, I like to, to brainstorm. I don't get along that well with people who nitpick. I can't stand unkindness. Being around unkindness drains my vitality faster than anything. Um, I'm a fight for the underdog person. So that, that fuels me. The anger fuels me, but ultimately it drains my vitality to be around those kinds of people. So hopefully that helps. OK. All right, I'm sure that's very helpful. So these are the questions that we have. So I want to thank you, Allison, for a really great presentation. And thanks for sharing so much of your personal story with us today. I'll just make sure uh, we have this last slide up here for everyone. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today and asking a lot of questions. We will be sending out this information that Allison has here on the slide. You can get that uh, in a follow-up email from us. And thank you again so much, Allison. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. Thanks. Bye-bye.